beautiful evening of the Nativity of our Lord. We welcome everyone, and we are grateful that you are with us. Everyone, no matter what age you are, no matter what your address is, no matter your color, no matter your sexual preference, this is a place that is open to everyone. This is a place where there is always room at the inn. And we are grateful that you have come to be a part of us this evening and to honor our Lord and to be prepared to receive God's grace on this special night. We invite you after the service to join us downstairs for our reception. We have wine and cheese and cookies and all kinds of goodies. And so we continue the celebration, we continue the feast uh, downstairs. So let us now prepare our hearts and minds for worship, for the Word made flesh dwelling among us. is from Isaiah chapter 9 verses 2 through 7. This poem promises deliverance from Assyrian oppression. The sign of this long-awaited freedom is the birth of a royal child with a name full of promise. In the sharing of these words, may we hear the living word of God. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of endless night, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the thundering warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Please rise as you are able for the reading of our Christmas Gospel.
In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the empire should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields keeping watch over their clock by night. Then an angel stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said, Do not be afraid, for behold, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, to the Christmas story, then you've probably noticed just how unusual it is. Jesus' birth, mm -hmm. it's unusual, right? Mm -hmm. And not just because angels are having a pop-up concert in a pasture. <laughs> but even the 
more plausible details. Even they are unusual, right? Mm -hmm. The long-awaited Messiah, God's anointed, comes into the world not with royal fanfare, but instead he's born quietly in a small province far from the center of power. He's born to a young couple, poor couple, unwed, or partially wed, but clearly not ready to start a family. I mean, the birth seems to even catch Mary off guard somehow. When she goes into labor, there's nary a midwife in sight, never mind a well-stocked birthing room. She delivers our Lord in a cattle shed. <clears throat> it's an unconventional entrance for a savior. Yeah, and you may have noticed how the people who come to welcome this savior into the world, how they're unconventional too. They're not dignitaries, or they're not priests. No, they're shepherds. Shepherding being one of the most despised occupations. Everyone in the first century knows that shepherds are shady. They're notorious for letting their flocks graze on other people's land. Moochers, you know. And they are the ones who are tasked with welcoming the Lord into the world. All these details may have become familiar to us, but if you've really stopped to think about it, surely you've noticed just how unusual and unconventional this story is. I've noticed it. You've noticed it. We've been there, done that. But this year, y'all, this year I had a big realization. This year it occurred to me for the first time that the nativity of our Lord is not just unusual and unconventional, it is also unsanitary. <laughs> Have y'all thought about this? <laughs> the nativity scene, it's gross. <laughs> like, like gross. I mean, yes, I've long known that a manger is a feeding trough for livestock. You know this, right? But I guess I've seen so many nativity scenes with, you know, their little figurines and their cleaned up faces with their clean press clothes in that impossibly clean cattle stall surrounding a manger that is filled with unnaturally clean hay with a, like, light beam, a sanitizing, sterilizing light beam from heaven coming down on the whole thing. I guess I've seen so much of that, I guess I really hadn't thought about just how this scene would have actually been. I mean, a feeding trough for livestock. Okay, sure, if my mother had been there with the can of Lysol she travels everywhere with, then that bad boy would have been 99.9% .9 germ free. <laughs> but I'm betting Mary didn't have Lysol. Or even good soap. So no matter how much elbow grease Joseph put into scrubbing that thing, there is no way this manger makes a sanitary environment for a newborn. And I'll be the first to admit it. I am a germaphobe who grew up on a farm. So yes, I have issues. <laughs> but I know how dirty the inside of a cattle stall can be. And yes, I think we should all be freaked out by the idea that our Lord was plopped down in a bed of dried animal saliva. And I really wish someone had taken away my internet access when I was preparing this sermon. Because an all too tempting Google search revealed that E. coli, E. coli, Say so. can survive Say so. 240 
45 days in a, wait for it, feeding trough <laughs> for livestock. Sweet baby Jesus, this makes my head hurt. The Christmas story isn't just unusual, it is also disgusting. And here's the thing. I think it's intended to be. <clears throat> We've gotten so used to our clean up nativity scenes that we may no longer see the grotesque scandal of this whole thing. Mm -hmm. But this story, it's meant to disgust us, to disturb us, because some things just don't go together. And there is something wrong with this picture. A baby is not supposed to be born in a cattle stall and laid in a feeding trough. It's disgusting. But it is precisely the manger, this grotesque crib, that serves as the key to understanding our Christmas story. The manger. That's the sign for discerning God's presence in this birth. Did you notice the sign that the angel gave the shepherds? He said, you will find a child, not that unusual, wrapped in bands of cloth, not that unusual, lying in a manger. Ding. He didn't say, you will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth whose mother's name is Mary. He didn't say, you will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth down three blocks from the synagogue, turn right at the Turkey Hill. No. It is only when that swaddled baby is paired with that manger, it is only when the feeding trough enters the picture that it becomes a sign of God's salvation coming into the world. It's a grotesque sign. And maybe that's the point. Pay attention to what disgusts you, for there you may just find the Savior. Disgust. It's a powerful emotional response, mm -hmm. and it's complicated. On the one hand, researchers tell us that there are certain things humans are universally disgusted by, certain sights and tastes that, from an evolutionary perspective, we are wired to find revolting. In this way, disgust serves as a survival instinct, right? We are disgusted by maggot-infested meat for a reason. <laughs> it has pathogens that can kill you. But then there are other things that disgust us. Things we have been socially conditioned to find disgusting. And this is where it gets complicated. People who study oppression dynamics, they have noticed that disgust is a powerful social tool used to keep minority populations subjugated. We learn in both subtle and explicit ways to find certain kinds of behaviors and physical traits and attributes disgusting. And thus we see people who have these behaviors and traits and attributes as inferior as less than human and unworthy of equal treatment. I certainly know about this on multiple levels. <laughs> I grew up as a white person in a very racist environment in the South. I was culturally conditioned to find certain things about black people displeasing, disgusting even. Their hair, your beautiful hair, I was conditioned to think was gross, greasy, and dirty, disgusting. Hmm. Yeah, and, and black folks.
folks eat gross food, I learned. Never mind that we ate mostly the same food. We just called it country cooking instead of soul food. But still. <laughs> I was conditioned. Before I even knew what the word conditioned meant, I was conditioned to see my African-American siblings not as brothers and sisters, but as subhuman. Disgusting hair, disgusting food, and who knows what kind of things are done in their neighborhoods. Mm. Yeah, there, then there's also what I learned about gay people. Mm -hmm. What I learned to feel. Two men kissing? Disgusting. Mm. Two women caressing? Gross. I saw these not as beautiful signs of love, but as repulsive, the subject of dirty jokes and ridicule. Mm -hmm. Imagine how I thought about myself then when I became aware of my own sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. The same gender attraction I discovered as a teen, I had already been conditioned to find repulsive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Talk about issues. I was conditioned to be grossed out by my very self. Mm -hmm. You may not have been raised in as extreme of an environment as I was, but make no mistake, the emotional response of disgust is a powerful tool used and manipulated to keep us fearing and dehumanizing people who are different from us. Mm -hmm. What do we call people living in extreme poverty? Dirt? Poor? What do politicians say about Mexican immigrants? All the disgusting things they will do when they come across the border. And what, what about people with extreme physical or mental disabilities? Avert your eyes, it's too disturbing. Yeah, let's not even get into what's said about people living with HIV and other <coughs> types of stigmatized diseases. Pay attention to what disgusts you, says our Christmas story. It may be a sign that your Savior is near. So let's consider our nativity scene again. Consider the cast of characters. Shady shepherds, dirt poor parents, a woman pregnant out of wedlock, a baby born not in any respectable environment, but in a nasty cattle shed. The whole scene and its cast of characters are the epitome of what a first century person who was good and upstanding would find disgusting. Completely disgusting. And consider this. When that baby grows up, he will spend his entire ministry going precisely to all the people considered disgusting in his world. He will go to them and tell them that they, society's disgusting ones, they are the most valuable ones in God's new society, God's society he called the kingdom. Yes. Yeah, the Savior who is laid in a feeding trough will grow up and go into the squalid ghettos, preaching good news to the poor. He will go into the city streets, touching the untouchable, lepers, people with disabilities. He will fashion a community out of foul-smelling day laborers and despised tax collectors. Yes. Yeah, and he will associate himself with all kinds of nasty women. <laughs> Women with bad reputations. Women demonized for not staying in their place. Yes. And yes, Mr. President, women with blood coming out of there wherever. Yes. Just read the story of Jesus and the woman with a menstruating disorder. Mm. Yeah, and this Savior will even have table fellowship with Samaritans. That ethnic group that first century Jews were brought up to abhor. And it all started with that feeding trough. The manger turns out to be the key for understanding the whole ministry of this Messiah. And tonight, 
The manger stands before us once again as a sign. Pay attention, it says. Pay attention to the people who disgust you. To the ones whom you would rather keep at arm's length. Maybe it's the mentally ill woman ranting in the street. Maybe it's the barista who unnerves you because he wears a dress. Or maybe it's the residents of the nursing home where your relative lives. Or the poor immigrant. Or the hijab-wearing Muslim. Or the hoodie-wearing teen. Maybe it's your own self. Mm -hmm. Maybe you were conditioned to find repulsive what you see in the mirror. Mm -hmm. Whoever it is, whoever you have been conditioned to recoil from, do not keep your distance, but go precisely to them, says our story. Go precisely to them and treat them like they are the most valuable people in God's society. Go to them and welcome them into your world. And just imagine, you may be welcoming your salvation. Amen.
We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. In peace we pray to you, O oh God. Blessed are you, source of peace. You rule the earth with truth and justice. Send your gift of peace to all nations of the world. Blessed are you, child of Mary. You share our humanity. Have mercy on the sick, the dying, and all who suffer this season. Blessed are you, child of God. You dwell among us as the Word made flesh. Bless us with your holy presence and inspire us to help those who have no place to dwell, even as we are called to make a home for you. O oh, Jesus, anointed one, light in the shadows, fire in our darkest night, united forever with you, we pray as you have taught us, our friend, our mother, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever.
be your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light by night. But Christ will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Let us pray as indicated. 